Professor Taylor's writings have won him a wide international reputation in the fields of political and moral philosophy. At the same time, he's maintained an active interest and involvement in public affairs. He did his graduate work in the 1950s at Oxford, where he helped to found the influential New Left Review. In the 60s, he returned to his native Montreal and tried to establish a foothold for the New Democratic Party in Quebec. Four times he stood for election to the House of Commons, once opposing Pierre Elliott Trudeau. Taylor was ultimately unsuccessful in his attempt to make the NDP at home in Quebec and Quebec at home in the NDP, but he has kept his interests in Canadian politics, writing for the Macdonald Royal Commission in the 1980s on Canada's political future, advising the Quebec government on language policy, and speaking out on constitutional questions. As a philosopher, Taylor's concerns have focused on what he calls philosophical anthropology, an effort to expose the roots of the contemporary sense of what it means to be human. His most recent book, Sources of the Self, traces the development of the modern identity and argues that this identity draws on much richer moral sources than its critics generally allow. We have yet to capture, he writes in the book, the unique combination of greatness and danger which characterizes the modern age. In these messy lectures, Professor Taylor continues his quest for a more balanced and comprehensive view of the modern age. He calls his lectures The Malaise of Modernity. Charles Taylor. In these five talks, I want to speak about the malaise of modernity. Now, by that, I mean features of our contemporary culture that people feel very, very worried about, even as they seem to flow from the development of our civilization. And the time scale actually can vary here. Sometimes people are very worried about developments that have taken place in the last 10 years, or sometimes the worry is about very deep lying features that have been coming about over three centuries. But there is this widespread sense of malaise around a number of features of modern society. Now, before I get into the particular features I want to talk about, I just want to mention one very strange thing about these. They're very familiar to us, and in a way, in one way we understand them very, very well, and in another way we find them very perplexing. And that's really why it's worth going at them again. Not that in looking at them again, anybody, including myself, is going to say anything strikingly new, but that we have this tremendous trouble getting them somehow in perspective, in focus. All right, let me launch into, in this first talk, an attempt just to outline three of them. And then in the other talks that follow, I'll go into one of them much more in much more detail and maybe uh, look more quickly at the other two. What are these three? Well, the first one, the one I'm going to spend most time on, is a kind of individualism. And this has been, of course, developing over many centuries. Individualism, by that I mean the, the change which has meant that human beings in the modern West don't feel themselves anymore to be parts of a larger order, a larger order of nature, a larger order of hierarchical society that very often in the old days was linked to the order of nature, that they understand themselves to be primarily individuals with rights, stand over against these orders, even think of the societies they live in as made by their own choices and will. Right? That's something of what I mean by modern individualism. And you can see that for lots of us, there's something very positive about that. And I want to argue later that some parts of that we just couldn't conceive of doing without. But at the same time, it's produced a lot of worry and anxiety. Because people have, some people have seen the development of individualism, the fading of the older horizons, moral horizons, as making our lives, well, in various ways, perhaps less heroic or flatter and narrower. I mean, take some examples. The famous French theorist Tocqueville, who visited the United States in the last century and wrote one of the most perceptive books about American society in the 1830s, which people still read today, he talked about individualism. He actually one of the people who perhaps invented this word. And he 
he expressed this worry that in an individualist age where people were turned away from the larger order of things, and larger society, they would get into a life filled of what he called petty and vulgar pleasures, that they would be enclosed within their own hearts. At the other end of the 19th century, if you like, we get something very parallel from a great German philosopher, Nietzsche, no relation to Tocqueville at all, but something similar, this worry that the modern individual in modern Western society would be interested only, as he says, in a pitiable comfort. That's his description of what he calls the last men. And we can go on and on at this when we talk about the way in which the worry of individualism has been, or the possible consequences of individualism, has recurred in the last couple of centuries. All right, very quickly, let me mention a second kind of worry, or area of worry, and that's something which has been interwoven with this worry of individualism. It's the increasing place in our lives of what we might call instrumental reason, means ends reasoning, where we decide certain questions by how to be most effective, how to organize our means most effectively for some end, as against deciding these questions by other considerations or other criteria. I mean, for instance, now you have all sorts of people who, in a sense, design their lives, where they're going to live, where they're going to move, what part of the world they're going to live in, in terms of getting the best job. Or you get societies at the same time designing their lives, where populations are going to concentrate, where there's going to be large groups of people and so on, in terms of the most effective uh, modes of production, way of, of producing. So decisions about where I'm going to live and decisions about what communities ought to be and how they ought to sustain themselves, which in previous centuries were taken as given by the way of life that we were brought up in, are now decided very often by considerations of efficiency, effectiveness. What's the most effective way to distribute the population? Should we in fact, help people in outlying regions to maintain themselves there, or should we encourage them to move into central cities like Toronto and Montreal, because that's a more effective way that they can enter the workforce. And here we have the steady growth of instrumental reason, of means-ends reasoning in our lives, and there again, we're very worried. At the same time, and we, as we welcome this in some ways, we find this very worrying we see the tremendous difficulty we have, for instance, in getting control of some of the uh, runaway forms of instrumental reason, like the growth of production in certain areas which threatens certain of the tolerances of the world in which we live. Worried about the ozone layer, for instance, because we produce certain products that threaten to thin it out. And we find we have the greatest difficulty in holding back on this and somehow getting control of this runaway engine. All right, so that's a second area, the area of the growth of instrumental reason. And then there's a third area which, in a way, grows out of the first two, and that's an area of political worry. Political worry about our lives being, in one sense, out of control. I mentioned that a minute ago. I'm giving the example of the ozone layer, wondering whether a society... Where there is runaway instrumental reason is one that we can really control. But on a deeper level, there's a worry about the growth of individualism, too. Can we really have a democratic society in which the members of it don't strongly identify with it, don't have a sense that it is their community, that they, in a certain sense, find part of their fulfillment in being citizens in this community? The worry is about, if you like, the decline of citizen identification and citizen allegiance. And, of course, here we can go back to Tocqueville again because I suppose this is one of the greatest formulations of this concern. The concern that the rise of modern individualism would produce a society in which people would, in the end, turn off, would lose their interest, would lose their sense of commitment to public life. And Tocqueville, way back in the 1830s, or actually the book was published in 1840 to be exact, but he draws this extraordinarily powerful picture of a, what he calls soft despotism, a society in which the government, as a, he calls it, a vast tutelary power, 
would take over people's lives in a sense with their tacit consent as they withdraw from the public domain and just let things happen. And this Tocqueville saw as a tremendous danger that was waiting for us in the democratic age. All right, so those are three worries. The worry about individualism, the worry about rampant instrumental reason, the worry about political society and citizenship. In a way, you can see they're all interwoven with each other. It's as though I were retaking three facets of the same worry because they are so interwoven. And I want in the talks and the rest of today's talk and the four that follow to try to go into these a bit and try to see what's at stake here. Now, there just won't be time to do all three equally. So what I've chosen to do is to take the first one as a really the main area of concentration. I want to talk about these worries about individualism and offer a certain view of how they should be seen. And then, I'm afraid all too quickly at the end, I'll refer to how something like a similar approach might illuminate the other two, instrumental reason and the political one. But let's look, first of all, in some detail at this worry of individualism. Now, I mentioned earlier this worry as it developed over the last two centuries, and I mentioned 19th century figures like Tocqueville and Nietzsche. But what's interesting about this is that this worry keeps returning, and it's, it has much more contemporary forms. I mean, I can take as an example a very, very influential recent book in the United States by Alan Bloom, The Closing of the American Mind, and Alan Bloom actually gave a couple of talks on ideas here in the CBC very recently. And we can see in the last few years since this book has been published, it's had a great impact. And what is Bloom talking about? Well, there he's talking, of course, about a certain segment of modern youth, modern students. But he's picking up on a more recent form of exactly this worry of modern individualism. He sees in his students overwhelming predominance of a kind of if you like moral relativism where each student thinks that everybody is into their own values, have adopted their own values, and nobody else ought to criticize each person's own values. And that leads to a view whereby they say that there aren't really objective criteria by which we can say that somebody in the values they've chosen in their life are right or wrong. They feel that somehow there's something wrong with applying these objective criteria that everyone ought to be, as it were, given the right, given the space to work things out for themselves. It's a kind of, of individualism, if you like. And Bloom goes on to talk about this in very much terms that we find recurring in different ways in Tocqueville and Nietzsche and others. Here's a quote from Bloom. He says, the loss of the books, by that he means the reading of the great books that the people no longer read anymore, the loss of the books has made them narrower and flatter. Narrower because they lack what is most necessary, a real basis for discontent with the present and awareness that there are alternatives to it. They are both more contented with what is and despairing of ever escaping from it. Flatter because without the interpretations of things, without the poetry or the imagination's activity, their souls are like mirrors, not of nature, but of what is around. So you have this picture of a kind of individualism, a breaking out of earlier moral horizons, and it's produced a life which is narrow, which has got less depth to it. And that, that worry, very much articulated by Bloom in that book, and it's that articulation, of course, that made the book a tremendous bestseller, a real phenomenon, a book by a professor of political theory, which was on the New York Times bestsellers list for I don't know how many weeks it makes you green with envy. And this because he touches this chord. And then we can think of a lot of other books of recent years, too. You know, we can think of Daniel Bell's Cultural Contradictions of Capitalism, where he talks about the hedonism of modern youth. And we can think of uh, Christopher Lash, for instance, very influential American historian who talks about the narcissistic self, right? The idea that somebody who's in, in, totally involved in themselves. So you can see this worry is being articulated again, and people are deeply concerned about it. All right, well now let's look at this because I think for all the interesting aperçu in these books by Bell and by Bloom and by Lash and others, there's a really big error of perception. 
Let me try to identify what it is. They talk about these young people as though they were just sort of shucking off uh, earlier moral constraints, as though they were just losing the earlier moral horizons and were falling into a kind of amoralism. Of course, they admit that they, these people very often talk in moral terms about what ought to do and what's a good life and so on. But they tend to see this as a kind of mm, uh, relatively transparent screen for self-indulgence. Here's another quote from Bloom. But the great majority of students, although they as much as anyone want to think well of themselves, are aware that they are busy with their own careers and their relationships. There's a certain rhetoric of self-fulfillment that gives a patina of glamour to this life, but they can see that there is nothing particularly noble about it. Survivalism has taken the place of heroism as the admired quality. Right? So there's that notion that when these young people talk of self-fulfillment, it's a kind of screen or patina or... It's not really where it is at. Now, I suggest that that's a really important error of perception there. And there's another way of seeing what these young people are doing. And that is that they're plugging into, or indeed they're emerging from, a very important moral vision, which I think is constitutive of modernity, which in a way this term self-fulfillment captures. A moral vision of individualism as involving a certain obligation on uh, the individual to be what he or she really has in it, in them to be, to express or realize themselves. Now, of course, a lot of the particular modes of behavior and action picked up by these writers in among modern youth, or indeed modern people in general, a lot of this is not at all admirable, and they're quite right to point out some of the more trivializing and even ridiculous modes of it. But I suggest we could see these in rather different terms. Instead of seeing them as an expression of amoralism, self-indulgence, the loss of a moral horizon, we might see them in a quite different way as degenerate forms of a very important moral ideal. Now, that way of looking at it oughtn't to surprise us or look strange, because if we look back over history just a little bit, we can see that there isn't any major moral or spiritual ideal that hasn't gone through periods when it's lived by the people who believe they belong to it in a degenerate or a debased or distorted form. As a matter of fact, the opposite may be the case. It may be for great spiritual ideals that we must rather look for the exceptional moments and perhaps the exceptional people who really live them to their full. So there's nothing strange in looking at the more debased or trivialized forms of what's been called by people like Lash the culture of narcissism, not simply as an expression of turning out from morality altogether, but to look at it as the uh, what happens when people who are deeply into a certain morality nevertheless lose the sense of what it really involves and slide towards trivialized forms. There are these, in other words, two ways of looking at it, and I want to argue that a lot of writers jump too quickly to the conclusion that we should look at it the first way. Let's call it the amoralist or self-indulgent way, instead of looking rather for the deeper sources of this in a certain morality. If you do the second, what you have to do, of course, is try to see what that morality really consists in at its best. And that involves going back in history, because this morality has developed over the last 200 years, and you can't just capture it if you look at its contemporary manifestations. And so looking at it the way I want to look at it, as a interesting morality, a powerful morality gone wrong, as against simply an abandonment of morality, involves digging into the sources, digging into the roots. And of course, once you dig into the roots of it, then what you have to say to these people who are living in this way is something really quite different. But before I go into that, which I want to take up later on, I'd like to step back a little bit and try to understand better why these two views have arisen, in particular, why the view I want to combat has such a powerful hold on modern consciousness.
it's not just the distemper of older people, older teachers before some of their students whose behavior they find weird or upsetting. It's something very much deeper in the whole way we tend to understand the last two centuries, three centuries, the, the rise of, of modernity. The idea that faced with, let's say, the behavior of the me generation of younger people who are turning off and so on, that we're just dealing with people who have left moral standards behind, that reading is very deeply anchored in a way we tend to think of the last three centuries. And in a way, I was already guilty of this. I was already partly responsible for this. I was falling into this myself in the very beginning of this talk because I did describe the rise of modern individualism in terms of the loss of a horizon, of old horizons in which people felt that they were part of larger orders, disappearing or decaying. In other words, I was giving a picture of it as a purely negative movement. There used to be moral structures, and now the moral structures have gone. I think these images are very deeply embedded in our consciousness, and they have been, some of them, of course, handed down to us by some of our greatest poets and thinkers. I wanted just to read a passage from a very famous 19th century poem, Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold, because it's this image in this stanza so brilliantly captures the view that I want to identify and then argue against. Here's Matthew Arnold. The sea of faith was once too at the full, and round earth's shore lay like the folds of bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy long withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind, down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. A very, very powerful stanza because it gives us that sense of the abandoned world, of what Max Weber called the disenchanted world, the world in which something that was there before the sea of faith has just left, and it's left nothing but the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. It's a very powerful view. I want to call this view for the rest of these talks the view from Dover Beach. I think that's a way of capturing it. Now, implicit in the way I want to see modern individualism is something very different. It's the idea not that, or not just that, an old morality got lost, but that a new morality, a new moral vision, was born and developed. So it's not just a matter of a world abandoned, a world lost. It's a world transformed. We may dislike in some ways, or may be uneasy in some ways, by this new morality, but it's not simply an absence, not simply a non-existence of, of the moral. But the view from Dover Beach is very, very powerfully anchored. It's powerfully anchored partly because, well, we do very often react when younger people come along with new modes of feeling very unsettled, and we tend to look at it as purely negative. But it's deeply anchored for much more powerful reasons, because we find it easy to identify as moral views the earlier horizons. The earlier horizons were very often very clearly religious views, for instance, and many people have abandoned religion or at least abandoned a formal religion. So it looks as though they had a clearly identifiable set of moral limits made by their religious views before, and now they no longer have them. Or the older views were views of a large order in the universe, which gave meaning to everything, and now that has gone. So it's, it's very easy to identify what we've moved away from over the last centuries as a moral view. Harder to understand what we're about because it's something much more centered on ourselves and much less recognizable in traditional ways as a moral view. And so for all those reasons, the view I'm arguing against, the view from Dover Beach, is something that we constantly have to criticize. We're constantly liable to fall into it again. And we have to make an effort, I think, to see the phenomena we're living, the modern world that we're living in, in this other light, as also reflecting something positive. So that's one reason why it's very easy to read what these young students are going through in the so-called me generation, to read it just as an absence of morality. But ironically, there's another reason, too, which makes it easier to read that way. 
which is that precisely the kind of, if you like, debased or trivialized forms in which this ethic of self-fulfillment has fallen have as their consequence that they cut these people off from some of the deeper sources and make them less easy to recognize. For instance, Bloom points out that the belief in a kind of facile relativism, your ethical view is yours, mine is mine, I can't criticize you, you can't criticize me, that belief in a kind of facile relativism is one of the consequences of this individualism. He's very acute on this, Bloom, and he points out that it's not just for, you might say, reasons to do with the theory of knowledge and the beliefs about the status of moral propositions that makes people um, believe in this. It's also because they think there's a sort of moral reason to believe in this, that there's something wrong in criticizing someone else or saying to them, I know better than you what your life ought to be about. Right? So we could see this kind of relativism as itself an offshoot from modern indiv individualism. But I think we can show, and I'll try to show it later on, that it's a disastrous one. It's one that, in a sense, betrays the very thrust and purpose of this modern individualism. Why? Well, because in a world in which there really are no standards whereby I can criticize you for falling short of yourself, then there ceases to be a real issue about what being you ought to be. And this kind of relativism undercuts the very ethic which generated it. There's a kind of mistake or slide which produces this debased form, a relativism generated out of a genuine ethic of self-fulfillment. I want to come back later on to defend that in more detail, but I want just to look at this phenomenon for a minute in order to understand why it, in a sense, covers its, its tracks. To the extent that you have people into the ethic of self-fulfillment and it takes in their lives the form of that kind of relativism, to that extent, they themselves become less and less capable of recognizing that they have a powerful moral view, that they are defending a powerful moral view. It falls under the axe of relativism where no powerful moral view can be defended before someone else who disagrees with it because that would be interfering with that other person's mode of life. And so paradoxically, the people who ought to be defending this individualism as a moral view get in a way awkward and shy and inhibited and unable to defend it as a moral view because they're unable really to espouse it as a full-blooded moral view. I mean, the consequence of which would be that they could criticize others for not following it. On Ideas tonight, you're listening to the first of the 1991 Massey Lectures. This year's lecturer is Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor. So it's as though the moral side here tends to get factored out, tends to get sidelined, as though the moral considerations behind this dispute tend to be put in the shade. Now, this is also contributed to by other developments that are very important in our day. Just think of the way in which the dominant trend in modern social science, which is very much seeped into popular consciousness, tends to understand the development of modernity, the whole development of the last three centuries. Here again, in a strange way, you find the moral motivations underlying modernity sidelined, sidetracked. It's very common in social science explanations to try to explain the coming to be of modern society, of uh, individualism, industrialization, and so on, in terms sometimes simply of the institutional developments themselves, as though, let's say, urbanization and industrialization came about, and the particular modes of outlook that go with them, like individualism, developed as a consequence of these institutional changes. And if one thinks that way, then the moral reasons for these changes in outlook tend to get totally forgotten. It's as though the outlook itself is produced as a kind of reflex to the new living conditions that people find themselves in, and we don't need to look for the moral motivations or the moral reasons. Or if sometimes people indeed do think that there were important changes of outlook and the changes of outlook are part of the cause of the coming to be of modern society, 
then people tended to look to things like the development of individualism, the the new importance of freedom, the greater emphasis put on instrumental reason. But very often in the social science tradition, these were understood in a sort of amoral mode. I mean, that is, they were understood as being changes in outlook that people were attracted to, not because of the moral ideals underlying them, but just because, in an understandable way, we can see how people might be attracted to them for their own purposes. We might understand that people might appreciate greater freedom because they'd be allowed to do whatever they wanted or would appreciate greater instrumental control over their environment because they could do with that whatever they felt like doing. These were thought of as developments that were attractive to people because they, is where they facilitated their lives, but not attractive because they represented a powerful moral vision or a moral ideal. As a matter of fact, it's been a dominant trend in social science to steer away from moral ideals in their explanation of how things came about. These are thought to be relatively less hard-nosed and scientific considerations, and it's been thought to be a weakness in science to have recourse to them. And so we've developed a self-consciousness of our history, which is fed by the popularization of social science uh, theories. We developed a conception of our history in which the moral dimension has been, as it were, bleached out. And modernity is seen as something which either came about in a fit of absence of mind or came about because of the attraction of basically non-moral, not in necessarily immoral, but basically non-moral changes in, in our outlook. Now, all that contributes to this sidelining of the moral or this relative inability to understand the development of the modern world of our modern outlook in terms of the intrinsic moral appeal that it has. All this contributes to the sidelining of the moral. And so does indeed the mode of liberalism that tends to arise from all this. The mode of liberalism which tends to arise from modern individualism is one that's very closely parallel to the motives that I've been talking about for soft relativism. That is the notion that a properly liberal society ought to leave people to pursue their own plan of life without interference and without even making judgments as a society about that plan of life and simply erect a society which facilitates equally everyone's pursuit of their plan of life, defends their rights and their freedom to devise it and carry it out on their own, prevents others from interfering with them, but doesn't in any way involve society as a whole espousing some view of the good life. This kind of, you might say, neutral or procedural liberalism has also become a very powerful force in modern society, a very persuasive definition of what liberal society is about. And it too, by its attempt, as it were, to sideline discussions of the good life in the public sphere, has tended to make us relatively inarticulate in our public discussions of what is really valuable and important in human life. So you have all these factors together. You have the, the tendency of those who support the culture of authenticity to slide towards a kind of relativism. You have the immense influence of social science mentality and our, and our self-understanding of the history of the, our last 300 years. And you have the impact of a very influential political formula. And in all these cases, what happens is not so much that the moral dimension is actually denied, because people are, after all, still aware that they are moved by moral issues, but the potentiality, the capacity to discuss these things, to articulate them, to make clear what they are about, atrophy. They atrophy because of the ban on open mutual criticism that relativism involves. They atrophy because of the disinterest and lack of attention the moral factors get in social science explanation. They atrophy because of a certain view of what public debate ought to be about in neutral liberalism. It's as though, although the moral instincts were still there, the capacity to say what they're all about, 
declines and withers. So we're in this rather weird predicament. We have a debate between people who are for and against these modern forms of individualism. The people who want to boost them on one hand and the people who want to attack them and knock them on the other. Now, the people who want to attack them tend to look at them simply as modes of self-indulgence, not as a reflection of a serious moral view. But strangely enough, the people that want to defend them, the people that are into these forms, are inhibited and shy and inarticulate and incapable of really articulating them as a serious moral view. So strangely enough, it gets to be accepted on both sides that one can't seriously talk about them and analyze them and bring out what they have behind them in terms of moral impulse. The moral impulse is almost by a unwitting conspiracy left in the shade and forgotten. Now, I want to enter this debate from neither of these perspectives. I'm neither a booster nor a knocker. What I want to do is try to shift the whole terrain of the debate so that we can, for the first time, bring out and take seriously the moral impulses behind modernity and, in particular, behind this form of individualism. All right, let's start today, in the last minutes of today's talk, by looking in more detail at this kind of individualism and at what I've been calling the debased or trivialized forms. First of all, what do I mean by that? Well, a whole host of things, but I want to pick out two very important strands in this. The first is the way in which this kind of modern individualism of self-fulfillment takes, as I've just mentioned, the form of a kind of facile relativism, a disbelief, in a sense, in moral standards that can cut across individuals and that one can use to criticize somebody's life. So let's call that the relativist direction. And the second feature of it I'll call for short atomism, the way in which this kind of individualism very often tends to loosen people's sense of identity and allegiance to any larger community. I need a word there. Community is perhaps not quite the right one, but I need a word general enough to cover all kinds of interpersonal knittings together, from families on one level to whole societies on, on the other. And what I'm pointing out there is the way in which, in many forms of modern individualism, the sense of one's life path and one's fulfillment as involving being one's life being interwoven with other people in long-term commitments in a family or in commitments to, let's say, a political society, tends to get eroded, tends to disappear, tends to be delegitimated, and people tend to turn inward on their own lives. Or the way, for instance, for a lot of people, the very ideal of self-fulfillment makes them look at the relationships they enter in, uh, in an instrumental way as something that is there to serve their self-fulfillment. I mean, incidentally, here we're beginning to see how the three malaise I'm talking about interweave because instrumental reason is coming in here. But I want to just look at it from the standpoint of what I've called atomism, the idea that the individual developing his or herself looks at the relationship in an instrumental way and not as something which should be an object of real allegiance or or commitment. Now, these are two ways in which I think you could say the ethic of self-fulfillment degenerates to relativism and atomism and does produce forms which are rightly criticized by the writers I've mentioned earlier, rightly picked up as something that we ought to see as a decline. All right, now, the, the issue is going to be, therefore, to see how to read these developments. And to repeat what I was saying earlier, to bring it together again, you can either read them as a slide of people away from all moral horizons altogether so that they end up, if you like, just being egoistic in their atomism and their relativism. Or you can read it as a misreading or misunderstanding of a very profound and important moral view. And which you do makes a great deal of difference in how you talk to people in modern culture, how one argues this. In one case, You'll simply want to say to them, snap out of it, recognize that there are moral goals in life, stop being self-indulgent, 
stop being simply selfish. You'll be speaking to them as you do to a kind of egoistic child. Snap out of it, look around you, see something bigger. In the second case, you have to do something rather different. You have to discover what this ideal that they, after all, espouse really means and what it really requires. You have to dig down to the roots of it and argue with them in the name of what they themselves really believe or what they themselves have given their lives to and try to show how it yields a very different kind of way of life than the one that they're in. How, as I want to argue later, it negates relativism and takes us beyond atomism. So in one case, you come at them with a rhetoric, if you like, of exhortation to turn away from egoism. In another case, in the, uh, from the other standpoint, you come at them rather as a discussion partner in a commonly understood ethic to which we as moderns, I believe, in some way or other, are all committed or, in, in a sense, all involved in the second case, of course, in order to come at them like this, we have to dig deeper into the sources of this ethic and try to understand better what it involves and dig more deeply into the nature of the human condition. And what we're involved in here, therefore, is a kind of reasoning about morality, about what's right and what's wrong. In a way, being involved in this argument is itself almost a, an attack on the facile relativism. And so, seeing that the nature of the discussion in very different terms, you also have a very different take on what the future might be of our civilization. If you come at it again, let's look at this once more, with the view from Dover Beach, and you see modern individualism just as an absence of morality, then you'll tend to despair of the future, because it does look as though individualism is gaining, and if that means amoralism, then amoralism is gaining, and there doesn't seem to be very much you can do about it beyond exhort, and exhortation doesn't always have a very good effect. If you see these people, on the other hand, as actuated by, as moved by a moral ideal, which they don't properly understand, then you'll see them as much more intention, as much more pulled more than one way, than the view from Dover Beach does, not just as sliding into self-indulgence, but as actually galvanized by a moral view that they don't fully understand, but that they can be made very concerned and questioning about if you can bring to them some understanding. From that point of view, the future of our civilization doesn't necessarily look as bleak. It, there is something we can do to turn its direction around to bring people back to a more integral f mode of living of the ethic that constitutes this culture. There are, of course, three assumptions that I'm making here that could be questioned. And I've just made them in this first talk or laid them out without really defending them, and I'll have to defend them later on. And let me just mention them here in closing. The first is that this modern ideal, the ideal I've been calling of self-fulfillment, actually is an ideal that ought to win our respect. That it isn't just a cloak for self-indulgence or something rather uh, contemptible. The second assumption that really was implicit in the last remarks I've been making is that you can argue with people about this, that reason can do something, that you can say to people, hey, we share this ideal and you're living it in a form which is not really at its best, so why don't you reconsider what you're doing? That reason has a role here. And the third assumption is that people aren't so imprisoned in the forms of modern instrumental reason, the society, the technology, the economy built on that, 
that they can change their lives, that they aren't forced into this track by the very structure of modern society, regardless of what they believe. So you have to believe it's a valid ideal. You have to believe you can reason about it. And you have to believe that we have enough freedom in modern society to do something about it if you do accept the arguments. If either or all three of these assumptions isn't true, then, of course, I'm wasting my breath and your time in looking into this. And so along the road of these remaining four talks, I'm going to have to take up those challenges, and I hope to be able to do that to some degree to your satisfaction. But at the beginning of tomorrow's talk, what I want to start doing is exploring the ethic behind self-fulfillment. And so for that, in the first case, I won't be addressing any of these three challenges right off. I'll be going back into history to try to understand just what it is that we are living today that underlies the ethic of self-fulfillment which powers modern individualism.